According to Caldwell Esselstyn, and I quote, if the truth be known, coronary artery disease is a toothless paper tiger that need never ever exist. And if it does exist, need never ever pro progress. A bold statement for many to consider, but as we've learned during the series, diet and lifestyle are indeed the tools that help people heal from and prevent many forms of cardiovascular disease. Tonight's special guest is Dr. Kushik Reddy, a plant-based interventional cardiologist who will share his knowledge as to how all the cardiovascular risk factors are preventable via healthy living and eating. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Spellows from Plant Powered Metro New York. And along with my co-host, Judith Zerden and Ben Mertens, we welcome you once again to this episode of Heart to Healthy Heart, plant-based conversations that can save your life. As always, we encourage you to use the chat box, tell us where you're viewing from, and to, as well to ask as many questions as your time allows. We have 30 minutes. Hopefully, we'll be able to get in as many as possible. Let's not delay anymore. Let me introduce tonight's guest, and we really appreciate him being here. Dr. Kushik Reddy is Director of Interventional Cardiology and Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of South Florida, James A. Haley VA Medical Center. He earned his medical degree at Gandhi Medical College in India, completed residency as chief resident in internal medicine at Jamaica Hospital in Queens, right down the road from me actually, and completed fellowship trainings in cardiology and interventional cardiology at Winthrop University Hospital in Mineola, New York. His board certification spanned cardiovascular diseases, interventional cardiology, and lifestyle medicine. In 2019, he founded Plant-Based Lifestyle Movement, a Tampa area community-based nonprofit organization that is working to take the power of plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine to the grassroots level. Dr. Reddy, it's an honor to have you here as a guest tonight. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Really so, appreciate the opportunity and thank you for having me on tonight. My pleasure. So talk to us about all the, the current burden of cardiovascular disease and how risk factors are indeed preventable. So I just want to kind of go through a quick time, you know, timeline in history, you know, in <clears throat> as far back as 1962, when the U.S. Surgeon General first declared smoking is injurious to human health, it took about another 10, 12 years, you know, maybe even 15. In 1978, there was a major <clears throat> meeting held in Bethesda, Maryland, the World Congress of Cardiologists. Everybody got together and said, we really have to do something from a public health promotion point of view to lower cardiovascular disease. And be because of that one singular, you know, policy driven agenda, uh, we have made a tremendous progress in cardiovascular disease burden compared to 1970s to as recently as up to 2010, 2011. And if you continue this exact same curves that kind of went on a declining path, continually declining path for almost three plus decades, but in the golden era, what people like myself <clears throat> in this field of cardiology and interventional cardiology and doing all the fancy procedures and, you know, advanced care in the coronary care units, we, you know, the, what is considered kind of a golden era is the past 10 to 15 years. And if you look at those curves of cardiovascular mortality, stroke mortality, congestive heart failure mortality, the lines have pretty much plateaued we were hardly able to lower even a single percent of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in the past 10 to 12 years. And on, on top of that, on top of that, congestive heart failure has now become one of the leading diagnoses, if not the leading diagnosis admission to a hospital. And, um, and the way I look at it is that my generation mostly and a generation before me uh, within the field of cardiovascular medicine or medicine in general, we have perfected the art of converting acute myocardial infarction or an acute heart attack into a chronic disease instead of channeling all of our talent and, and skill sets and intelligence into preventing it. And society at large, medical community, you know, from a, from a personal a disease burden and not to mention from a financial burden point of view, we're all paying the price. To summarize all of this in an updated version of cardiovascular disease burden and the risk burden, Two papers were published very recently in, <clears throat> in JAC, in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. And 
the editorial that went with it, appropriately so, was titled A Population Level Code Blue. Just let that sink in, folks. Cardio, no, we, 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 are, we are openly accepting it that we, we, have, we are in a situation, the entire society is now going through, a, from at least from a cardiovascular perspective, a population level code blue. And subsequently, just two days ago, new data came out that, that, that is projecting you know, cardiovascular disease and the related risk factors, how they are potentially and likely to grow between 2025 and 2060. The prediction is diabetes is going to grow by an additional 40%. Obesity is going to grow by another 18 to 20%. So the current paradigm is just not sustainable, especially knowing extremely well that most of the cardiovascular risk factors, the related disease, the related morbidity and mortality are preventable. Yes. You know, many times people need certain medications, even from a preventive point of view. But even before prevention, before primary prevention, there's a concept called primordial prevention. Some of you may have heard that. For those of you who have never heard the term, it's an old term when the World Health Organization coined it 30 plus years ago, which is why work on nutrition and lifestyle when hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and you know, high, high cholesterol show up? Why not start as early as possible and never become a hypertensive in the first place? So that's the concept of primordial prevention is don't even accrue a combination of risk factors. So it, it is a very concerning and alarming statistic, but we have to start somewhere. And, and for my share, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I run a cath lab and I'm in the CCU, the director of the CCU, I do a lot of these procedures and take care of some of the sickest sick patients. But we have to we have to prevent this. There's really no other way. We have to spin these wheels of prevention like it's like literally it's like our last ride. There's incredible amounts of information that you just showed us right there. Um, what I want to do right now, Dr. Reddy, is actually pass it over to Judith and Ben for a couple of questions as we're getting questions coming in from the audience. So, uh, Judith, I think you have the first one for the doctor tonight. Yes. Good evening, Dr. Reddy. It's so good to be with yeah. you. So I've heard you say uh, in some of your talks that people today are living longer, dying longer. Just can you just tell us what you mean by, by that? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I kind of bring that to everybody's attention as one of the opening slides in almost all of my talks. So if you go back 100 years ago, an average person in this country died around 45. That was the life expectancy in America exactly 100 years ago. And, and, and there were various reasons because, you know, be it lack of access to universal vaccination, infectious diseases, I know not having invented some of the antibiotics or, you know, public sanitation, clean drinking water, all those things. And we kind of take those things for granted. And then for all those combined reasons, an average person now in America lives to be 78. Phenomenal progress, phenomenal progress. But the unique beauty with that is that such a proportional, proportional degree of increase in life expectancy is not uniquely American. The same thing happened literally all over the world, including in some of the poorest of the poor countries. Compared to 100 years ago, people are living much, much, much longer. But sadly, if you plot that graph, you know, the reason, you know, one of the things I always ask my patients, friends and family, or even my audience is, you know, why, why, why do we actually want to be healthy? And then those answers almost always fall into two reasons as to why any one of us want to be healthy. One reason is quality of life. And second reason is quantity of life. But in terms of quality of life, each one of us will define it differently. For, for one of you, it may be wanting to go back to run a marathon in your 60s. For the other person, the quality of life may be just being able to walk from the front door to the mailbox without having to deal with the diabetic severe neuro neuropathic pain, right? And then <clears throat> if you plot those graphs from quality on quality against quantity, today's curve looks like a very bizarre convoluted shape from down the slope of which from very early on in our life, we are you know, accumulating disease burden, such as childhood eating habits, related to childhood cardiovascular risk factors. We can do an entire discussion for an hour on the concerning and alarming accumulation of risk factors in children 
obesity and type 2 diabetes is something that at least I have never heard when I was a medical student that the type 2 diabetes is a possibility. So because of all these diseases accumulating early on, yes, we are living longer, but we are also dying longer, which is coming at the expense of losing good quality of life. So that can be quantified, you know, epidemiologists and you know, people in public health quantify this as disability adjusted loss of years, meaning that how many years is uh, our, Amer our average Americans losing while they are living alive, living longer, losing their life to lack of quality. It turns out to be the average is a shocking number of 23.6 years. And, and it, it, as, the, as, as shocking as the number may sound, what, what are you, that can be true. People are losing a quarter of a century. Just look around. Look, talk to your friends, talk to our parents, some of ourselves. Yes, I'm alive, but I, I'm not at my dinner table with my family for Christmas or Thanksgiving or any other religious holiday because I'm being tube fed in a nursing home because of hypertension related stroke, which is preventable in a majority of people. I'm not even able to go take my dog, a family dog with the grandkids down the, walk, down the street for a walk because my feet hurt or I just got an amputation because of a peripheral vascular disease. Or I'm not on a cruise ship because I'm on that dialysis machine due to combination of hypertension and diabetes, which in a majority of people is preventable. So that's what I mean, kind of a long-winded answer. I'm sorry about that, but is what do I mean by living longer and dying longer? Instead, what I argue is that by taking care of you know, simple things, in, inexpensive simple things, most of us, even in the setting of a high genetic risk, right, <clears throat> can live as, as good a quality of life as possible. Yes, sometimes you will have events. Sometimes we will have you know, need for medical procedures and that's all part of it. But like Dr. Kim Williams said, one of the previous guests here, I love that you know, saying from Dr. Williams is that I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want it to be my fault. <clears throat> Impressive. D Dr. Reddy, what is your role as an interventional cardiologist? So that's my, you know, yeah, it's interesting. So that's my primary job. I'm trained as an interventionalist and the director of the lab. And I, you know, I do procedures. I did a bunch of them today. And my role is to do all types of coronary, you know, vascular procedures. And that's, that's my primary modality of uh, my, my life line of work. But I'm also an interventional cardiologist. And for those of you who don't know, if you were to train in the U.S. system to become an interventional cardiologist, when I was in training, it's about 15 years of continuous uninterrupted training after high school. Now it's 17 years. So during those many years of training, especially once you enter cardiology, we spend a lot of time in the deep, you know, lead dungeons of lead shielded cardiac cath lab doing procedures. So it's unusual for someone like myself to step outside the confines of a cardiac cath lab and make a humble plea. Uh, first to myself uh, as a professional to reinvent myself and two, to my colleagues, my friends, my family, my, you know, now to the society at large is, uh, you know, as experienced as I may be, as talented as I may be, don't meet me there. Don't meet me there. So to convey that message, believe it or not, I am the crazy interventional cardiologist who walks the floors of the hospital wearing a scrub top that reads under my name that I have a carrot and a stent. You pick. <laughs> All right. How is that for an interventional cardiologist, right? Yes, and um, so that that really leads perfectly into my next question, which is, what was there any particular thing or time that you can remember that motivated you to leave the dungeons of the cath lab? And I've been there; it's cold, and it's to to go outside and to make your humble plea to your colleagues. What 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 motivated you? So one, I haven't left the cath lab. I'm still in the cath lab. I am actually the director of interventional cardiology. I'm teaching. I teach. You know, I've you know I work with the two interventional fellows uh, today. We're you know teaching them how to do these procedures. But I don't have a personal compelling story. Not from a, either my personal health reasons or a family health reasons. It was one of those just random bizarre days. About I want to say now almost six seven years ago now. 
on a day, you know, what I call routine, I did a bunch of procedures, sat at my desk and, you know, routinely, mundanely as a habit, uh, as a trained professional, I should say, it was just going on with my business of compiling and completing patient procedure related, you know, notes and charts and uh, the related, you know, reporting. And then it's not like I detected a new pattern that never existed. It's the same old pattern, but that day I questioned it. And I have no idea why I questioned it. It's just true, honest story. I just, you know, my question was, if I am treating, you know, in a full academic medical center with trainees, research, you know, all kinds of going on, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and we are quote unquote counseling patients to, you know, eat healthy, uh, whatever that meant back then to me, and uh, lose weight and be active. If you're all doing all these things, why are such a high proportion of patients who we are treating to go are still needing my services in the cath lab? Isn't the very idea of treating them is never to have these events, at least in the most part. But, and, and that's what kind of made me question, is this, how we, is this actually how we treat this disease that I make a living off of? So I literally stopped doing my work and I went through a little bit of a contemplation and introspection. So I, back then my wife used to work for the VA as a primary care doctor. I picked up the phone and I called her and said, honey, look, I'm having an interesting question. She goes, what is that? I think I'm questioning my entire professional paradigm. I think I got it wrong. This is not how we treat this disease or the risk factors. And she said to me, honey, we got a name for this. It's called the midlife crisis. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how it started. You know, what, started as a, what started as a more of a personal inquiry towards my own profession mm -hmm. uh, led to a deep passion. And because all of this was not known to me, you know, because besides talking to a patient and the family and say, hey, go home and eat healthy. Besides that, I really don't did not know the data actually how to counsel a patient because yeah, even if you acquire the knowledge and acquire the data, the, the 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 most important skill is behavioral modification, something that us doctors don't get taught. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, it's easy for me to you know come across a patient who has had a heart attack, wants to make changes, and I'm you know go on rattling about you know got to sleep eight hours a day, got to work thirty minute walk, and rat, you know six or seven pit the pillars of lifestyle medicine. But when the rubber hits the road, making that behavioral modification is 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 very difficult. That in itself is a huge skill, and it took me about a few years to say that I kind of have that skill now. Uh, but the, the past six years of, you know, while I continue to do what I do, as both as a director of the cath, interventional cardiology and the CCU doing procedures and taking care of some of the sickest of six patients is about how to prevent them from ending up there and how to make them see the value in the pillars of lifestyle medicine without ever diluting the essence of contemporary and evidence-based medicine. And, and those, those six years of learning how to find the balance have been the most rewarding and frustrating years of my professional career. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Dr. Reddy, can you tell us um, about any successes with patients in your practice who have adopted a plant, whole food plant-based diet? Oh yeah, oh, absolutely. The phenomenal stories and we're trying to put together as a, you know, these are all anecdotal and, and again, you know, while I say stories it, in, in, the, in, the, in the hierarchy of science, a, you know, a case report, you know, somebody, somebody saying that, hey, this thing happened to me. So yes, it is great. It is, you know, makes us think, oh, wow, what is here? But usually, you know, case reports are, you know, here, if you ask me patient related stories uh, in the hierarchy of medicine are at the rock bottom, meaning that they're considered the lowest order of evidence. But that being said, the reason I like sharing stories is because we make a lot of our decisions in our life based on stories. We sometimes we become who we are based on stories. So it's extremely important to get these stories out that, you know, people who struggled with insulin injections, people who struggle with four to five blood pressure medications, you know, somebody like me shows up on a you know, virtual call because of COVID, you know, counsels them, gives them some PDFs and they see the value in it. And, you know, top three months go by and they pick up the phone and call you. And this, you know, 70 year old combat veterans from Vietnam are crying on the phone because they're no longer taking insulin because somebody opened up the door for them and this some, something clicked. So there are countless stories like that. We know veterans who are not able to walk uh, uh, from, you know, from the front yard to uh, out of their neighborhood without having to pop a nitro pill are now running half marathons. 
Yeah, and it's and, and the diet is 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 only one part of that equation, and and we taught them how to you know come, you know meet with like-minded individuals, because social support is extremely important, and that's what your you the, this program is all about is to get this message to as many people. People lean on each other, seek support, because without that, and that's one of the things that the, the program that I run at the hospital. And yes, we talk a lot about plant-based nutrition or you know in the healthiest possible way of eating. But the foundation of our program is actually social support, either through the medical care system or through the community. So because of a combination of all of that, yes, there are phenomenal stories. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that this, this is now it's actually it's, it's not even, you know, kind of a my message that is uniquely different. This is a gold standard evidence based contemporary practice, meaning every Wednesday we meet with our entire team, cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, and we discuss these complex coronary intervention procedures. And almost invariably, unless it is an emergency heart attack, unless the pumping capacity of their heart is going down, unless there is a blockage in a location called the left main, guess what everybody says? Has this patient completed a six to eight weeks of lifestyle, therapeutic lifestyle program with, under Dr. Reddy's supervision? If not, why are we opening the man's chest? Right. So this is not some, you know, some crazy in the silos type of practice. This is, has now become the mainstream, uh, and not because I am driving it, but the evidence and the contemporary medical guidelines suggest that that and the, you know all of these interventions should be done uh, only after you know a strong. Uh, you know, contemporary evidence-based lifestyle strategies and medical therapies fail. Would you uh, briefly describe for us the six pillars of lifestyle medicine? Yeah, the six pillars of lifestyle medicine is, you know, I mean, there's no particular order, but I, the way I see them in an order is that, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of hot, hot, an order of hierarchy, if you want to call it that, is... Uh, <clears throat> Social support, that's number one. The next number is stress reduction and mindfulness. Third one is sleep. Uh, fourth is, is uh, toxins, alcohol and, and tobacco. And fifth one is physical activity. Sixth one is nutrition. Those are the six pillars. Is there a reason that you put nutrition at the bottom of the list? Do you think Not that necessarily, it's... as I said, I just, I kind of put, because the reason I say that is that it's, at least in my, you know, counseling of close to 2,000 patients at the hospital as part of, you know, six-week group session, what we have noticed is that unless we connect the dots in that sequence, you know, that we offer them, you know, a lot of, you know, people living alone, they don't have means to cook, that they don't even know how to cook. And then I show up and say, you need to learn how to eat sweet, sweet potato and broccoli for breakfast. For them, it's a, such a foreign idea. Uh, but once we offer them support, once we, whatever the stressors are, in their life, we take them away. At least we show them here we are to help the system or, you know, look, there are neighbors within your own community who are doing this. Go to these events um, and learn these skills. And then it kind of becomes a nice blended equation um, because we know that, you know, lack of social support is a direct causal link for heart attacks. Lack of sleep is now officially got added as the eighth pillar by the American Heart Association just a month ago as a direct causal link for um, heart disease. So to, the way I see this, I, like I said earlier, I don't necessarily see them as a hierarchy, which goes first. I just name them that way. Right. Um, and also depends on where the patients are. If a patient comes and says, doc, the main reason I'm not able to adapt this is I just don't have support. I don't even know how to cook. Mm -hmm. And then we have to prioritize the hierarchy of those six pillars a little differently uh, without ever losing the sight that you got to nourish your body the right way. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me take it from here because I know we have a couple of questions from the audience and we still want to make sure you talk about PBLM and the work you're doing down there. But we've gotten two people who've asked some very similar types of questions, which is, um, well, about why food isn't necessarily fixing their problem. So somebody said, LDL, what could make the LDL go up 25 after we dropped 100 points eating the same way? Is that something you see oftentimes? Uh, in patients, or is it usually triggered by one of the other lifestyle pillars? You would not really, I mean, no, in, so LDL going up is there are so many factors that can do it. You know, the age of the patient, you know, did the patient transition into a different hormone, you know, menopause, postmenopausal status, 
thyroid status can affect uh, LDL situations. And sometimes, you know, people do have a lot, lot of plant-based people who are, you know, they swear by, I don't touch, you know, any, any animal products. I'm eating as clean as I can. And yet my LDL is not dropping. You know, there are many, so many, so many locations there could be genetic mutations, including, you know, the, how the gut absorbs your cholesterol. And, you know, some of us, you know, even the tiniest little amount that is in the food, is saturated fat gets sucked in and, um, and vice versa. And there are some people um, who, no matter how much they eat, they just don't absorb. And then, so there's a huge, you know, many, many, many reasons, you know, unless I look at the details of the blood profile uh, or, or sometimes we may even have to do some special testing to see why LDL would continue to go up. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, yeah, so usually I, 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 I won't be able to give like a one simple answer and say, this is the reason why your LDL went up because there's so many factors that affect it. Yeah. And another question that came in also about cholesterol being high and had an ultra fast CAT scan arteries are clear. So is it okay? Is it normal to have high cholesterol while still having clear arteries? Yeah. So it depends on <clears throat> when we see it meaning that is because this cholesterol related heart disease is not something that happens between last month and three months from now. This is a very slow process that happens over the course of many, 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 many years. So if you have high cholesterol and if you have other risk factors, if you have a negative calcium score, all that it means is that yes, you're being lucky. The disease has, you know, is probably there, but you don't have enough of a calcified disease, right? That doesn't mean that you don't have plaque. All that it can tell is all that it tells you that you don't have plaque that already built the calcium inside of it that is not visible on a coronary and on a calcium score, right? So you have to also look at other risk factors. What is the cholesterol numbers? How long have they been high? And, and another way of quantifying this is that there's a beautiful way of, it's called officially in medical terminology, it is called cholesterol years, meaning that you take your LDL, the LDL cholesterol, and you multiply that with, by your age, and you'll get a number. Let's say you're 50 years of age and your LDL is 100, that number is 5,000. So it should never be more than 5,000. So I'll give an example. I'm 52 years of age, and my LDL without any treatment is usually 47. Right. So one of the brightest minds in this field has recently written a paper kind of outlining all of this, assuming if I do everything right and I live to be 100, I'm just randomly throwing out a number, even at 100, that product of my LDL and my age would still be just barely at 5000. So if you do that, it is biologically possible based on what we know now, you can live to be 100 without suffering a cardiovascular event. So the thing with LDL is that no matter what your cholesterol numbers, no, no matter what your CAT scan numbers are, the thing with LDL, it is causal. It causes heart disease to keep it as low as possible for as long as possible by whatever means it takes. So as we're about to wrap up in the 30 minutes went so fast, I know you've been involved in PBLM. So can you tell the audience about what you're doing and what that organization is all about? So PBLM is a nonprofit that my wife and I, we got together with a bunch of local area leaders, you know, people who run restaurants, schools and, you know, churches and other religious organizations. And the main idea behind that was that every time I go to medical, you know, lifestyle medicine meetings or plant based nutrition meetings, I'm usually in the confines of, you know, like minded individuals, like minded professional, passionate people from, you know, all other, you know, uh, healthcare workers. And then. The reality when I come back home and I start going to work between my home and, the, and my work, there are at least 30 fast food, junk food restaurants. The question that bothered me is that, yes, I'm, I'm talking to everybody in the medical community, but who is taking this message to the precinct? Who is taking this message to a, an elementary school teacher or the kids and their parents? So we quickly, you know, kind of, a, you know, put out a Facebook uh, invite and we met the people who are, you know, like-minded and we formed a board and we became a nonprofit. And uh, soon after we got hit with COVID, but even during COVID, we've been holding some Facebook events. And every February, I invite some of the, some of the leading, uh, you know, thought leaders in the world of you know, plant-based nutrition and cardiology to come and uh, do a labor of love. We run four, four uh, Saturday lectures on Heart Healthy Month. So yeah, basically it's a nonprofit organization whose mission is to take the pillars of nutrition, evidence-based clinical nutrition and uh, lifestyle medicine 
uh, as a labor of love and uh, to the community so they don't end up in my cardiac cath lab. We can hope they don't. And we're going to ask one more question because two of the same came in. So let's get a quick answer if that's ever possible about calcium CAT scans. Is it only a snapshot in time and should people do one as part of their regular physical? No, don't, don't repeat CAT scans. Don't repeat CAT scans. Just do one. Two things that just, if you want to check, if you think you're at a high risk, lipoprotein little a, check with your doctor, get it once. Don't, don't pay for it. Don't waste your money repeating it every year because it is almost entirely genetically determined. And you know that once, and then, and there's really not much you can do to lower it. There's some drugs that are being tested, except for there's one study by a plant-based doctor out in Houston tested that in African-Americans on a plant-based diet in that one subgroup, it may drop by 10 to 15% points, but really we don't have outcomes data. Calcium score, once you know it, but the reality though, because what I'm gonna tell you based on that, I'm gonna tell you exactly the same thing is eat a predominantly a plant-based diet, if not an exclusively plant-based diet and do all the other things right with your lifestyle because I'm not gonna tell you anything differently. So there, yeah, it, it, CAT scan has its value where the, you know, it, it can be used as a risk enhancer for either medical decision-making of certain kind or to initiate statin therapy in a, in a high-risk patient, it, it helps. But there's really no need to keep on doing it as an annual physical, just mm -hmm. an unnecessary exposure to radiation. Dr. Reddy, it's been an amazing half hour. Let's give one more plug for pblm.org. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. And thank you for your time tonight to share all your knowledge and expertise with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, wish everybody in the audience a happy, healthy holiday season and uh, best of health and best of life. That's what's important for us all. We are now going to go to next week. We've had some amazing doctors as guests, and we're thrilled to say that's going to continue in November as we welcome Dr. Michael Greger as our guest on Thursday, the 17th of November. We are so excited. It's the beginning of the Plantathon month for Plant Powered Metro New York, and he's going to be here. And I don't think that Judy, Ben, or I are going to have any time to ask questions because everybody else is going to want to. So if you want to watch any of our episodes, again, they're all on the Plant Powered Metro New York YouTube channel. On behalf of Judith and Ben, again, I am Jim Spellows. We are so happy that you are with us. We wish you optimal health. We hope that we see you again in a month's time right here on Heart to Healthy Heart. Take care.